A film that's releasing digitally on November 10th is a film called Dome House 6. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer-director of Dome House 6, Stephen Osborne. Stephen, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you for having me, Pete. I'm really excited to be involved and, and talk about this film. Absolutely. Good to talk to you. And and I know this is your first film as a director, although you've written uh, some other stuff and you've been involved in other things, which we might talk about later. But what was the inspiration behind uh, making uh, Dome House 6? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, basically, from my point of view, it's about in this independent filmmaking, it's, it's quite challenging. And there's so many great talented cast and crew available around who don't have the opportunity to work on the big studio stuff in, you know, creative roles and in, in large roles. So it was more about getting a bunch of creative like-minded people together and um, to do a film that we could pull off uh, on a low budget, but to make it look as polished and professional as we could. So yeah, really it was just about creating opportunity um, for creative people to get involved and to make a film that hopefully the world gets to see, which, you know, thanks to Bounty Films, we got a distribution deal. That's great to see. Yes, uh, that, fantastic. Now, this is a, a science fiction film um, with four characters, two mainly. Um, tell me about the actual story, the drafting of the screenplay and, and getting all that right. Yes. Uh, so as you said, it's about characters. That's really mainly the the theme of the film. It's about characters and relationships and challenges that, you know, different personalities have been forced together in one household. And setting it in that kind of uh, soft sci-fi world was basically the best opportunity to say, you know, if you don't like someone, you could just leave the house, right? So putting them in an element where going outside is actually quite dangerous and it's better to be stuck inside with these kind of toxic characters and relationships. Uh, I think that's where the idea stemmed from, was just putting four different personalities in one household. And, um, yeah, that's kind of where the drafting started, was just how do you create four interesting characters that are so completely different from each other? And then what scenario would they be involved together? Because you wouldn't be friends normally. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, first of all, the, the film is framed with the idea of climate change and of the environment um, having a major impact uh, on people. Uh, and secondly, you've got uh, a number of twists and turns when these uh, people are in confined spaces and uh, have to not venture outside and so on. So I can imagine plotting that and developing those twists and turns without giving spoilers to the audience, um, uh, was was a challenge in itself. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is kind of hard and difficult to create something that's fresh and, and not been seen before. I mean, and of course, even as a filmmaker, you take influence from some of the great films, uh, especially in these kind of genres, there's a lot of films that stand out. Um, so you got to take influence from something, but then to make it your own and put your own spin on it. And of course, to develop something that people don't see coming. And I think what I tried to do with this was misdirection. Um, a lot of people who were halfway through the film would go, oh, I understand what's going on here. The house is going to kill people, you know, because it's AI and it's futuristic and that's a very typical plot line. Uh, but then to kind of strip that away, that element towards the end and go, you know, the house had really nothing to do with with the murders and stuff like that. Um ah. Yeah, I think that's what we're trying to do is that plot, you know, the frame it like the house was going to be the, the evil, the evil kind of protagonist, uh, antagonist in the film, and then to, you know, trick the audience that it wasn't. No. Uh, well, in fact, I thought with the, with the house speaking and so on, it was almost like Howl in 2001. I, I was I was wondering if, if uh, there were any particular films that inspired uh, your approach. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think there was a film, um, Ex Machina, or Ex Machina. Um, definitely, I think just, again, something trying to achieve something on an independent budget is quite difficult. So when you can strip it back and have one location, uh, it, you know, it saves a lot of cost. So that film did so well to have basically, you know, three characters and one location, but you were never bored throughout the whole film. And I think that's what I tried to take inspiration from is like, okay, uh, you don't need, you know, explosions and you don't need multiple locations. And as long as the characters are interesting, 
and the storyline is interesting, it should be a watchable film. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so tell me about casting. I, I didn't particularly recognise the actors, but that doesn't matter, of course. But tell me about finding the right people to uh, populate your film. Yes, so casting is always a challenging thing too with an independent budget. Uh, you're having to find, well, we went with Queensland Talent, being based in Queensland, and we shot entirely in Queensland. Mm. So we went with locals. But just people have met and worked with on um, smaller projects throughout the years. So uh, Jordan Abbey Young being one of the lead cast who plays Harvey, uh, he's, you know, kind of up and coming and he's been doing a lot of films, um, you know, like Danger Close and stuff like that. Uh, but having known him personally too, reaching out to him, I said, look, I've got this crazy script. Is this something being involved? And, you know, having that go-getter personality was like, yes, I'll jump on board this. Uh, same with Madeline Ray, the lead there who plays Sydney, is actually her first time uh, acting, essentially. Uh, she had just, she was in the middle of a film course uh, studying acting and I kind of poached her from her course to come on board as Sydney. Um, uh, Prem, who plays uh, Micah, he's um he's from Malaysia and he's had a lot of theatre background experience in Malaysia and he's done a lot of stuff a lot of TVCs, but he just had the perfect, he's kind of almost a likeable character and that's the whole energy. Like he's somewhat likeable throughout it, uh, but then he kind of has a sinister side to him. Uh, so he did such a great job with that. And then uh, Gabrielle Brown, who plays Red, she was in a similar boat. She'd just finished film school, you know, finished an acting course. Uh, so it was really good to have these, you know, kind of new, some you know, some experienced and, and some not, and they're kind of bouncing off each other to kind of create these characters. So, uh, yeah. And then for The Voice for the House, we end up uh, going to someone a little bit bigger and we've got Charlotte Best involved, um, Australian actress who started in like Puberty Blues and, and uh, Home and Away. And we reached out to her and said, hey, look, just, just a long shot. Here's a script. Uh, if you're interested, can we fly you, you know, down the queen, up to Queensland? And, um, record your voice and she loved the script and wanted to involve so we were able to secure Charlotte Best. Okay uh, what an interesting process so well done on that. Yeah. <laughs> now tell me because this is your first film as director and as you say a lot of these actors they haven't uh, uh, acted before some have what was your process in directing them and did you rehearse with them how did how did all of that work? We did we did a couple of table reads uh, prior to shooting, which was really, really good. And that helped with developing the script as well, just getting their suggestions and, and feedback on their kind of character development. Uh, when it got to shooting, though, we had the location for about 10 days. That's all we could kind of uh, afford budget-wise. Uh, so we were shooting about nine pages a day to kind of achieve this film, which is very ambitious. And... The characters were just fantastic. Like they would show up knowing their lines, which makes my job so much easier. You know, we're not wasting takes on, on forgetting lines and stuff. So then I was really able to work with them and 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 try to get the kind of characters out of them because they already did the prep. You know, they knew the lines. Um, and rehearsals were all done on location because, you know, a lot of the times it was their first time seeing the location was on the day they'd get there. Um, but yeah, it was kind of an interesting journey just working with them and trying to get the characters out of them. So, oh, well done on that again. What a process and and a pretty tight schedule by the sounds of it, too. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> so really uh, tight schedule, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, I, I admire that low budget filmmaking, you have to, uh to be so careful about uh making all that, doing all that. How did you find the location? It's a very interesting house. It's a very interesting house. It actually featured in Grand Designs Australia a few years back. Ah. Uh, I wasn't aware of it then until later on. But um, uh, my actual job in the film industry when I'm not doing my own stuff is actually location scouts. Uh, so that's kind of something that, uh, you know, it's just natural to me. But also I love interesting locations. I feel like every location should be a character in the film, not just the location. So even with that location, we would frame it in a way that the house is almost the third character, you know, with that film. And uh, I think that was really important. And also too, you go to this effort to find a perfect location and a lot of people shoot really tight. 
and you know you don't really showcase the location so our cinematographer was like let's shoot as wide as possible as much as possible so but yeah finding it was just um uh looking through airbnb was a good start and uh it was available for rent through airbnb uh at mount tambourine on the gold coast so i contacted him personally and said look you know can we talk about this potential idea i'm not sure if it's something you're familiar with you know filmmaking and that and we went off the airbnb website and we reached out uh, submitted some scripts to him to show him what we're kind of trying to achieve with this property because it is an expensive property um, and prior to that we had a few other options that we had in mind which were also fantastic but it just that house felt right you know it felt like the right character for the film well, again, well done on that. It, it it certainly is a character of its own. So I I agree with you. It's uh, yeah, it's a, such an interesting process. So uh, of course, the other aspect of uh, any filmmaking is getting the film out there. And as you mentioned, Bounty Films took it on. Tell me about that process and how the film is releasing, uh, digitally, etc. Yeah, fantastic. So this is my first kind of major film, especially my first film with distribution. And it's not something they teach you in film school, is it? Uh, how to distribute your film. Like mm. they teach you how to make a film, which is fantastic. But there's this whole other business back end and being a creative minded person, it's not really something we focus on as business. But if you don't get a film out there and you don't make money, well, then you can't, it's not a sustainable career. So distribution we had to go for. And it was an interesting thing. We world premiered it at the Gold Coast Film Festival and um it we were sold out theater essentially uh, which was really really good we had a lot of support locally and i think that really helped having that kind of audience there and people talking about it and then once bounty films reached out to me and said you know we, we want to look at your film i submitted them a screener and basically straight away they were like yeah we would love to take this on and we'd love to help you get it to a wider widest audience as possible so we submitted it back then though it wasn't quite finished we still had the sound mix to do it was still getting revisited with some effects and stuff like that so it was about a year kind of in that world of still getting the post done and distribution done and then once leslie came on board from bounty films he helped us with you know subtitling and all that kind of interesting stuff which is something you don't think about when you're making the film mm. And now it's available. We're looking at, you know, Google Play, uh, YouTube movies for rent and buy digitally. Uh, we've got a DVD and Blu-ray release uh, in the US and um, amazon.com.au is also selling the product. So it's kind of bigger than I expected it would go. Mm. And uh, as Leslie said too, this is tier one and then tier two will release it to some other, you know, streaming services and stuff like that. So yeah, hopefully everyone can see a copy of it. Oh, terrific, terrific stuff. And I was going to ask you about uh, budget too, because uh, in terms of producing the film or getting the film made, you need to have a budget of some sort. How easy was that to achieve? Uh, so I did a film a few years earlier than that, another feature film called Strangeville, which was a sci-fi comedy. And it's not distributed yet, but we're in the process of all that as well. It's very close. Basically, we did a screening of that in Sydney. We did a screening of that on the Gold Coast. And it was just one of those kind of films that um, everyone enjoyed. You know, we laughed. Everyone, it was emotional. It was a lot of fun journey with these kind of fun characters. After that, I had some private investors just kind of reach out and said, look, if you're ever going to do another film, we would love to help you. Because I did that self-funded the first one and on a micro budget. And they would just said, look, we'd love to see what you could achieve with some actual money. So still talking micro budget with Dome House, of course, but a lot more money than what I had. And that was basically how the funding came about. Okay. Again, a really interesting process. I'm glad it all sort of came together and, and worked out well for you. So that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Now you've mentioned that you've you've in the past you've also been location manager and so on. Tell me about um, getting into the film industry. What was it that attracted you and 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 working uh, as a location manager? Uh, I think uh, Portable Door was one of the films you worked on and so on. Yes, 
the interest in film kind of always stemmed back from being a child. Like I remember back in the day, my parents would take me to Video Easy, you know, on a Friday night and, you know, give us $10 for my sister and I to go get a couple of weekly films and that. And dad always had an interest in it too. Like we would have a, you know, a pretty like an old reprojection TV and kind of a old school sound system. And we're just trying to watch films that sounded good and looked good. So I've always kind of had a passion in film. But growing up, I grew up in Stanthorpe, Queensland. So it's a small country town. You, you don't think that there's a film industry in this country, uh, you know, let alone on the Gold Coast, which is so close. So it didn't seem like a really believable, achievable dream to follow. So I went through other revenues into like um, farming, catering, uh, then into graphic design. And then I finally, when I got a bit older, I realized that there is a film industry in Australia and that people are making films. So that sparked me to study it for a little bit. And I studied at the New York Film Academy on the Gold Coast. And once I got my diploma, I was like, this is what I want to do. I love it. You know, all those other jobs were, were fine, but... Um, you know, I can't see myself doing this forever. So once I started in film making my own stuff, I was like, this is great, but I still need a paycheck. Uh, so that's when I started reaching out to applying for bigger films. So I got my first break on Dora and the Lost City of Gold in the Greens department, funny enough. And then from that, I fell into locations and absolutely love location scouting and on-set location management. Um, and since then, I've worked on like the Young Rock season two. I've been working on a series at the moment called Apples Never Fall, uh, which is a new one coming out. Uh, Black Snow, so up in uh, North Queensland. And then, so location scouting has become something of a, a great interest, uh, and it's still contributing into the film industry. So that's mm. what I love too. You get to involved with creative people, and you're networking, you're meeting new people. Uh, but my true passion is still independent films. That's you know what I want to do and where I want to go in long term. Okay, uh, again, such an interesting history, and uh, well done on that. So, are you planning yeah. uh, more films at the moment? Yes, a hundred percent. We've just got a new script now uh, that has just been greenlit with a budget, uh, a bigger budget than Dome House, which is fantastic news. Uh, we start pre-production as of to, well, today, technically, uh, aiming to shoot in early January and uh, staying in the same genre of the sci-fi thriller, uh, a little bit more drama in it, a little little bit of comedy in it, a uh, very multi-genre film. And I, I think I like that because being a young filmmaker, you know, new to the industry, trying to find your style, your voice and the genres that you want to do is is challenging. And you can't make a film every you know couple of months to experiment with every genre. Uh, it's too expensive. So I thought, well, why not try a real multi-genre film and blend all these different genres together uh, in a way that's interesting and entertaining? And then maybe then I'll find which kind of genre I want to end up in, you know, and and my style. Okay. Well, good luck with all that, and I uh, hope all of that goes well. That's that's terrific, Stephen. And just to conclude, a question I love asking filmmakers, uh, have you seen anything else of late that has impressed you? There's multiple films. It's uh, You always put on the spot when you get questions like this. <laughs> uh, but of late, I actually watched that new Australian horror film, Talk To Me. Um, yeah, it's great to see Australians making great content like that. And it is a fantastic film. So that's something I would recommend for sure. And, and you know, being homegrown. I think that's fantastic. Okay. Yep. That's a good recommendation. And certainly I recommend that people go to uh, the various digital outlets to have a look at Dome House 6. And it's been my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer-director of Dome House 6, uh, Stephen uh, Osborne. Stephen, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you so much for having me, Peter. It's been fantastic. Terrific. All the best. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.